What's up guys? Today we're gonna look at Mac 65, one of the best assembler editors ever created for the Atari computer. So stick around. We're gonna get into this and we're gonna learn about Mac 65 and how well it works and how much better it works than the Atari assembler. Stick around, don't go anywhere. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. So today we're gonna to talk about Mac 65. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Mac 65 is, it's a assembler editor slash debugger toolkit for the Atari 8-bit computers, okay? This is one of the best um, assembler editor slash debuggers that was ever created for the Atari, okay? Now, in the series that we've been going through and learning assembly language, and, and I've been teaching you some assembly language, we've been using the Atari version of their assembler editor cartridge, okay? That version of that assembler editor cartridge was actually written by a company called OSS for Atari. And um, the guys that worked on that assembler editor were actually the same guys who started the Mac 65 um, assembler for OSS. And it was a later, um, I guess, redo of the Atari assembler since the Atari assembler was very slow. It was very functional. And as you can see from our experiences with it, it worked, okay? But the Mac 65 was created to take care of all the flaws and the deficiencies um, that the Atari assembler had in it. Um, the gentleman who headed the Mac 65 project for OSS, his name is Steven Laro. And um, I, want you to guys, I want you guys to go uh, at some point, look in the description, I've got a link down there to an antic podcast with the guys over there who actually interviewed Steven. And he talks about his time at OSS and his work on the Mac 65 assembler. It's a fascinating interview. I highly recommend you go check it out. But anyway, we're gonna take a look at the Mac 65 today. We're gonna get into it. I'm gonna show you a little bit about it. It's, believe it or not, it's, it's very similar to the Atari assembler since in reality, it was derived, all of its work was derived from the Atari assembler. So everything we've learned so far about the Atari assembler is most likely, or it's pretty much going to apply to Mac 65, where Mac 65 is a little different is in the debugger. The debugger was actually written by another person. Uh, I wanna say his name is Jim Dunyon. Um, I'm also gonna create uh, some links below uh, in the description where you can learn a little bit more about him. He was a brilliant guy from what I've read. He was the one who actually created the debugger, which was then licensed to OSS for this Mac 65 assembler. And um, at some point that guy um, did kill himself. He committed suicide. Um, so you can learn a little bit about him. And I think he dedicated a lot of his um, programming time, a lot of his computer time in building that with the, with the debugger for the, uh, the Mac 65 assembler. It's called DDT. Well, I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, um, how well it is. But this Mac 65 assembler is the tool that we're gonna be using going forward in our assembly language programming. It's super fast in its assembling, and um, the debugger is uh, so much better than the debugger that's in the Atari assembler. So why don't we go ahead and, and fire up the computer, and let's take our first look at the Mac 65. Now, if you guys don't have a copy of Mac 65, I don't have an original copy of Mac 65. So what I've done is I've used my ultimate cartridge. I think you guys may have seen my video on this. If you haven't, take a look at the link I'm gonna throw in the video. Um, this cartridge here is the ultimate cartridge for the Atari and it allows you to uh, place on SD cards ROM files um, and game programs and you can run them and this will emulate the original cartridge. So what you can do is on my website, uh, www.8bit and more.com, you can download the Mac 65 um, assembler editor. And if you, have, if you get yourself one of these cartridges, you can throw that ROM file on the SD card and then you can follow along with the series where we're gonna be using Mac 65 to do all kinds of cool stuff with the Atari. So anyway, let's fire up the computer and let's get into it. All right guys, so here we are. And I've got my ultimate cartridge in with Mac 65 version 1.2 loaded into the Atari. So as you can see, uh, upon startup of the program, we're at an edit prompt. Now this edit prompt 
Uh, very similar to the Atari assembler editor. Um, we've got a list command. We can start typing in programs by just simply using line numbers, pressing enter. Um, we've got the num command, which will automatically increase the line numbers for you. Um, so in that respect, it's very similar to what we've been learning with the Atari Assembler editor. Okay, as you can see, we can list our program there. All right, new command works just like the Atari Assembler editor. Um, the assemble command works just like the Atari Assembler editor, but I think what you're gonna find is that the ASM command on the Mac 65 is lightning speed compared to what we were used to experiencing on the Atari. So on the, on the Atari assembler editor, the way that we got into the debugger, which was the bug command. Well, this doesn't have a bug command on Mac 65. Instead, what it has is DDT. Now the story goes, I've got my Mac 65 assembler manual here. Okay, here we go. Introduction to D DDT. The name DDT, a, a software analog to the biological bug killer of the same name has been used for many other debug programs on other systems. So DDT, it's, it came from the, 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 DD, the product of which I'm sure you've heard DDT, which is a bug killer of the same name, DDT. That's where the name DDT for this debugger came from. So if you ever wanted to know where the name DDT came from, now you actually know. So a little piece of history there. So anyway, let's go type DDT, enter. And this is the actual debugger screen. This is a very interactive debugger. And we'll, I'll show you how to use this in just a second. But the way we get out of the debugger is with the Q button. All right, so DDT gets us into the debugger. Q gets us out of the debugger. So let's go ahead and load up a, well, let's load up the program that we always go to when we're learning something new in assembly language. What it does is it changes the border colors on the screen in an infinite loop. I actually added it now where it actually changes the, the border color and the main screen, which is play field number two in text mode. But anyway, we've got our source code here now. Arrow keys work as, as normally. And the only thing we have to do differently, by the way, this source code is line by line verbatim of what I typed in the Atari assembler. The only line I had to add was what's called this directive. <coughs> Excuse me. Dot OPT is a directive, and we'll talk about directives later, um, for the assembler, which tells the assembler to act or do a certain function. So the dot OPT directive tells the assembler that we want to actually create object code. What does that mean? Okay. If I leave line five out and I type assemble, which we can go ahead and just blank this line out. Five is gone. If I type ASM, it will assemble the code, but it didn't actually write the object code into memory. All right. So for example, my program here is assembling at 4,000. You can see that in line 10. So if I assemble this code, I would, as we're used to in the Atari assembler, if we go to look at memory location 4000, our, our machine code would actually be in that memory location. I'll talk about this command after. But if we look at 4000 in the debugger here, we can see it's all zeros. Okay? So let's go back to the source code. And you just have to remember that you have to add this directive at the top of your file. to create object code. And I did it again. Can't type today, guys. Dot OPT object. So now let's assemble. Now we go into the debugger. And now we can see at location 4000, our program starts, all right? So that's one of the little important things that I wanted to mention early on is that you wanna have that dot OPT directive in all your source code so that it actually creates object code into memory. Now, the reason why that's an option is if you're writing something new and you're assembling to, let's say, a very tight area in memory that might in be in between some operating system code or, or some type of a code that's used by BASIC or maybe another cartridge that's in the computer, 
and you accidentally overrun that area of memory, you could freeze the computer or you could, you know, write, overwrite some bytes in memory in the computer that could cause it to start acting weird. So by not having that OPT option for creating object code, you can type out a bunch of assembly and assemble it and just work out all the bugs of it without actually writing to anything in the Atari's memory. So it's kind of like a little safety feature if you're writing something new or experimental and you're not actually interested in executing it right away. So we'll leave it in there for now for us. So anyway, let's go ahead and like I said, assemble it to memory. Now you can see how fast this actually assembled, all right? And what I'd like to do is just to give you a, a for example of how fast this is. I'm gonna assemble this and I want you to watch how fast it assembles. And I'll count out loud roughly in seconds as soon as I hit enter. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. So three seconds or just under three seconds to assemble that code. All right. So just for comparative purposes, I am going to pop this out and I am going to pop in the assembler editor cartridge that we've been using. And I'm going to kind of do the same assemble test and let's see how much slower the Atari cartridge is, the Atari assembler editor is at compiling that small program. So let's go ahead and load that up. Just so you guys can see, it's the same program, all right? So let's go ahead and do the same test. Ready? 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000. So in this particular example, it was twice as fast. Okay, so, and I've, I've actually done some tests on much larger programs, and it seemed to me, the testing that I did, that as the program source gets larger and larger, it exponentially gets faster and faster. So, huge difference, huge difference in the, in the assemble speeds. And that's just one of the benefits that this cartridge brings us. So let's go back into the assembler editor from my ultimate cartridge here. I'm sorry, back into the Mac 65. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we can execute this code now on Mac 65. What we, do, what we used to do in the Atari Assembler Editor is we would type bug, and then we would basically go to that location. It's similar to that in the Mac 65, but there's different ways of executing the code. So here's our, here's our source code again, let's assemble it. And by the way, if you're, not, if you're not interested in seeing all that verbose listing, there is another directive we can do here. Um, I think it's OPT no list. Now when we assemble, you see how quick that was? That was like a second or less. So that's, that's another way of speeding up your assembly, just having it not list out all the code when you're just building your code and have it assemble much, much faster. So let's go into the debugger, DT, DDT. Now, this top screen here, you can see the column headings, LOC period, which stands for location in memory, VAL, which stands for the value in hex for that memory location, and then the next column, which has instruction, which contains the, which contains the instruction whatever, with whatever operands go with that instruction. And then you can also see there on the second row, DDT copyright 1984 James J. Dunyon, pronounced directly there in front of you. Below that is a window with a black background which gives us a snapshot into, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 lines, 11 lines of memory. So this is almost like a view into the computer's memory or our program, should I say. Uh, and that little arrow on the top left-hand corner, the little uh, greater than symbol, that points to where in memory currently the debugger is set to execute its next instruction. So we know, I'm gonna hit Q, let's go back to our source code. We know that our program is assembled at 4,000 in this particular example, okay? So what we wanna do, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna point the debugger to our code in memory. And the way we do that is by hitting the asterisk key, okay? Now, I want you to notice, I want you to watch in the lower right-hand corner where it says enter command. I'm gonna type in the asterisk key, 
And what it did was it immediately put a space for me after the asterisk and it's waiting for me to type in an address. So I'm gonna type in 4,000. Now as soon as I press enter, I want you to watch in the code window where that greater than symbol ends up pointing. Did you see that? Let me do it again. I did star, puts the space in for me, 4,000, enter. That sets the debugger to start executing at whatever address I type in, which in this case is 4,000, which is the start of our program in memory. So if I wanna go ahead and execute this code, I could do it one of several ways, but in order to run the code straight, I can either hit the start key, which I'm gonna go ahead and press the start key on my computer, and you can see what it did. It's executing my code right now. I hope this looks okay through the, the video capture device, but what you should see on your screen is um, a continuous from top to bottom, uh, like a rainbow effect of colors for the vertical scan lines for graphics mode zero. So the way I'm gonna get out of this is my program is set to wait for any key to be pressed and we execute an RTS instruction, which brings us right back to the debugger. And you can see our program counter, which is the greater than symbol, symbol is pointing at 401B, which is the break command in our, in our program. All right, so let's do that one more time. Star 4000 gets us to the start of our program. Now, the last time I hit start, this time I'm gonna hit the command, the next command I'm gonna show you, which is G for go to address, and I'm gonna type 4000. And there we are. We're right back to our execution of our program, okay? So there's two ways to start the program. You can set the program counter to the start uh, in memory of where you want the code to start executing and press start, or you can just type G for go and type in the, the location manually and it'll take you right to that area uh, of your code and start executing it. Now, the way you step through your code is with the, well, we're not, I'm gonna show you the first way is with the option key. So our program counter right now is set to 4,000. So by pressing the option key, I'm gonna execute one instruction and it will execute that instruction and then move to the next instruction. So right now we're at 4,000, I'm gonna press the option key, which is going to load the X register with 255. So let's watch two things. Let's watch the program counter or the greater than signal sig symbol. And let's also watch the X register as soon as I press option. So here we go, option. All right. So our program counter moved to 4002 in memory. And our X register, as you can see, is loaded with FF255. So now I can step through the next instruction, which is storing the X register into memory location 2FC. So I'm gonna go ahead and press option, execute that instruction, which will then land us on the next instruction, which is the load accumulator, and so on. So every time I press option, I'm stepping through a line of the code, line by line, or instruction by instruction, okay? So I can sit here and just hit option, 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 and loop through all the instructions in my code and do it that way. Now, there's another way of stepping through the code automatically. So let's get back to the beginning of our program. And that's with the I, which stands for interactive mode, all right? The interactive mode, it will basically loop through your program as fast as it can while being in a debug environment and execute your program automatically, instruction by instruction. Let's go ahead and hit the I command. And you can see how quickly it's executing the, the program with the exception of obviously having to update the debug window, the program counter window, and everything that we see on the screen here right now. The select button from the debugger takes us over to our main window, which if we hit the I command, will run us through the interactive mode. And we can then break that way. So let's try that again. Start of the program 4000, I for interactive, which means it's gonna step through the program automatically and allows us to watch the, the program counter and any of our register values as we're going through that. And break stops it, obviously. 
Before we hit the interactive command, if we hit the select key to get back to our main screen, then we hit the interactive command. We can actually watch what the program is doing as it's executing our program line by line. Now, the output is gonna be a little different than if we were to run it using the start command because in interactive mode, it's, the program's running a little slower. So for this particular example, it's not able to update the, the horizontal sync fast enough in interactive mode to give us the right output. This is what it should look like. Again, I'm not sure if you're seeing this properly through the capture device, but you can definitely see a difference between what you see right now versus what you see here if I do interactive mode this way, okay? So basically, think of the interactive mode as a way of, is the, it's almost like the automatic trace mode from the Atari assembler. We used to use the trace command, uh, except this is a little bit faster, a little bit more intuitive, okay? Now, there's a couple other, let's talk about the rest of this window. So we talked about location and value, we talked about instruction, we talked about the window that shows your code and the memory addresses. Now, below that main window, you can see BKP1, which stands for breakpoint point one. You see BK.2, which stands for breakpoint two, and so forth, breakpoint three and breakpoint four. You can have up to four breakpoints defined in your code um, to stop executing or break execution so, that you, so it allows you to examine your program counter or your registers or issue some commands. And the way you set a breakpoint is with the B command, okay? So for example, let's set a breakpoint here in our program before we store the X register at location 4002. So if I wanted to set a breakpoint at 4002, I would type B, the breakpoint number one through four, comma, the memory location, so 4002. Now watch breakpoint number one, which is right now at 0000, Watch what it equals after I press enter, 4002. All right, so let's go ahead and interactively start this program with the I, and let's see if the program stops at 4002, which we'll get, it's gonna be in one, one instruction. So here we go, and there we go. It stopped at 4002. You can see our, our pointer, which is the greater than sign. It's at 4002. Now at this point, I could go ahead and option and continue stepping through the program, okay? But it's nice to be able to set breakpoints so that if you have a lot of code, like let's say you have a lot of initialization code that has to happen every time before you get to an area of your code that you're interested in debugging. Well, instead of having to step through that 100 lines or 200 lines of initial, initial, initialization code every time, you could set a breakpoint at the beginning of the area of the code that you're interested in debugging, and in interactive mode, let the debugger zip through all that initialization code, and then you get a breakpoint that stops you right where you need to be and to start debugging the code that you're interested in debugging. So up to four breakpoints, a very useful um, uh, set of tools, um, which wasn't available in the Atari assembler, by the way. All right. Now, the other thing we can do with this debugger is we can examine some memory or any type of, any, any part of the computer memory right here in the debugger. Okay, so let's do, let's try and do examine. Let's examine, I don't know, 5,000. Okay, so that's cool. What that did was it took us to memory location 5,000. As you can see, our pointer there is at 5,000. So we can use our up and down arrows here to cycle through and examine, you know, upwards and downwards in memory. So that's kind of cool. Let's say you're writing or you're copying some data in memory, you wanna see what's there before. This is a good way to examine that memory. Okay, so important. Um, right now I'm at address 4,000. If I go to examine another part of the computer's memory, and let's say I don't remember where I was, okay? If I can type E asterisk, it'll take me back to where I was. So that's a good thing to remember. If you, if you move away from your program and you start horsing around looking at other parts of memory, let's say you, you set a breakpoint in your program and you broke it at some arbitrary 
your location and you didn't write it down and then you went to examine memory and you forget where you were, if you need to get back and continue debugging the program, just type E asterisk and it'll take you back to where you were. Um, the other thing we can do is we can deposit information into memory or we can change um, memory locations in the Atari computer with the debugger. So the deposit command is useful to place one through six bytes in memory. So wherever you want to change memory in the computer, you have to get the pointer in the display window to that part of memory. So let's go to with the star 5000, and you can see at 5000 we've basically got zeros. So let's say I wanted to fill 5000 through 5006 with 255. Maybe I'm doing some testing and some memory and I need to put some values in there before I debug my program. So let's go deposit. Let's do FF, that's one. FF, that's two. FF, that's three. FF, that's four. FF, that's five. FF, that's six. Location 5000 through 5005, actually, because we're at a zero base index. It did fill it with uh, 255, 255, 255, 255, 255, 255. Very cool. So you're able to shove values into memory six bytes at a time by first putting the memory pointer to the area in memory where you wanna start filling those values and then go ahead and type your values in. Let's talk about the next command, which is move memory. The move memory command simply does what its name implies. It moves one or more bytes of memory from one location to another. Okay, so Basically, what we're going to do, the format is M, the source address. So before we get too carried away, let's move these six bytes that we shoved from 5,000 to 5,005 to, let's examine 6,000. 6,000 looks pretty free to me. All right, so we're gonna move these six bytes from 5,000 over to 6,000. You go, then the format is M for move, source address, 5,000, and then right back to back, we put the destination address, so I'm gonna go 6,000, and then the number of bytes to move from the source location to the destination location. The length may be any number from 0001 to FFFF. So let's move from 5,000 to 6,000 and 0003 or 0006. There we go. So it's picky about the length, the length parameter. I guess it wants us to use four digits or the full 16 bit number that represents the length of the number of bytes we wanna move. Okay, so let's take a look at the next command which is the search for a string of bytes. So I've got my program counter set back to the beginning of our program. Uh, this basically search command will search for any arbitrary string of bytes. You can give it one byte, two byte, three bytes, you know, whatever string of bytes you give it, it will find. So for example, if we go to look for D4, you'll see that at the memory address location 4007, it'll take us right to it. And the next one is uh, 4,000 and A. So if we did D4 again, it would take us to 4,000 A. So if you've got a lot of bytes in your program and you, you know a specific byte or string of bytes represents an area of the code that you want to go to, you can use the search command and go right to it. Okay. So let's finish talking about the remainder of the items in the window here. Uh, we talked about our four breakpoints. If you look to the right of the breakpoints, you can see the status register. Um, there's eight bits there, and you've basically got your carry flag, your zero result flag, your interrupt disable flag, decimal mode flag, the break command, um, the expansion, the overflow, and the negative results. So that's where you can actually see your bits for your status flags, and they'll always be right there, changing as you're modifying your code or running your program or what have you. Then of course at the bottom we talked about the command window. So this represents your debug environment, um, and we've pretty much covered most of the main points of interest 
to how we're gonna be using this debugger. So again, Q gets you out of the debugger. Most of the editing that's done through the editing screen you're familiar with, it's very similar to the Atari assembler. So anyway guys, that's my brief introduction into the Mac 65. It should be enough information for you to get the Mac 65 up and running, type in some sample or some simple source, assemble it, debug it, run it, and get your feet familiar with this assembler because this is the assembler we're gonna be moving forward with, doing all of our assembly language learning, um, when we port what we're doing for the player missile graphics and some of the more advanced game writing routines, we're gonna be doing it through the Mac 65. So I encourage everyone to get a copy of it and start getting used to it. And with that being said, we're gonna call it for this video. If you like what you see, give me a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and give me some comments. Let me know what you'd like to see me do in the future. I've got a lot of stuff coming up using assembly language. We're gonna be doing some graphic routines. We're gonna be doing some sprites. And uh, we're ultimately gonna write that game. We're gonna finish that game that we started in basic and we're gonna actually port it to assembly language. So lots of good stuff coming up. Be on the lookout for it. Thanks for watching guys. Go Atari. See you in the next video.